Let us join our voices together in the call to worship. We gather to share in our love of God. Lord, open our hearts and let us share your good news. We gather to share our witness to God's goodness. Lord, let our lives bear witness through service to your people. We praise to gather God, we gather to praise God whose love is eternal. Lord, open our hearts today to raise your praises. Amen. Please join me in prayer. Pray in God, you have shown us your truth and love in Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. And we praise you for the many ways you reveal yourself to us in the creation around us, in the faces of our families and friends, in the faces of every one of your children. Eternal God, we gather this day to acclaim your glory, to raise your praises. May our worship be pleasing in your sight. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our hymn is for the beauty of the earth. I encourage you to meditate on the words as Jane plays. Friends, we journey through this Lenten season knowing that we have not fully followed in the ways of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we come to a time of confession. We will confess with humility, but we are assured of Christ's intervention for us and, Christ, and God's mercy and empowering grace. Let us join our voices in our prayer of confession. Wondrous God, we confess that at times our doubts and fears override our hope and faith. Forgive us when we lose sight of the joy of your love and instead fall into despair and gloom. Lift up our spirits, Lord, and help us remember the promise of new life here and now, not just the hope of resurrection for the future. We give thanks for your son, Jesus the Christ, who continues to offer us new life 
who continues to break down the walls of death in our own life. Forgive us, restore us, renew us. In the name of our risen Savior, Jesus the Christ, we pray. Almighty God, hear us now as we each offer our silent prayers of confession. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, to save each one of us. Everyone who confesses their sin and resolves to follow Jesus Christ as a disciple is forgiven. And we receive the promise of new life and the promise of the resurrection. Go and share this wondrous news of God's love in Jesus Christ, knowing that you are forgiven and freed. Thanks be to God. Amen and amen. Let us stand together for the glory of God. Please join me, join me in the prayer for illumination. Living God, help us to hear your holy word with open hearts so that we may utterly understand and understanding that we may believe and believing that we may follow in all faithfulness and obedience, seeking your honor and glory in all that we do through Christ our Lord, amen. The Old Testament reading is Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 10, and verse 2, chapter 2, verses 1 through 2. Listen to God's word. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the day the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the vault and separated the water under the vault from the water above it, and it was so. God called the vault sky, and there was evening, and there was morning, the second day. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place and let the dry ground appear. And it was so, God called the dry ground land and the gathered water, water waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. And so on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Thank you, Kent. During this Lenten season, we've been exploring the details of the Emmaus Road story. We know that the two travelers were confused and sorrowful after leaving Jerusalem after Christ's death. All the disciples were devastated by what had happened in Jerusalem. None of them had really understood when Jesus said he would rise again. 
So instead of looking forward with anticipation to seeing the risen Christ, the disciples were grief stricken and confused. These two disciples are traveling from Jerusalem to Emmaus. They're joined by the stranger who is Jesus, but they don't recognize him. And the three discuss the events of the previous week, including Jesus' crucifixion, their dashed hopes, and the surprising account of what the women had seen in the garden. Today's New Testament reading comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verses 22 to 24. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came back and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Each of the four Gospels tell of the empty tomb, signifying its importance in the story of Jesus' death and resurrection. Now, we don't often think very long about the significance of the empty tomb because we move quickly to the resurrected Christ. But indeed, God was present at creation and at the tomb, present in that darkness and emptiness, working to bring about new life. So let's put ourselves this morning at the tomb with the stone rolled away. What does the empty tomb mean for each one of us? Well, first the need for a tomb signifies that Jesus had a physical body, a body of flesh and blood. The gospels tell us that Joseph of Arimathea who was a member of the council had, and who had disagreed with the council's decision had asked Pilate for Jesus' body so Jesus could be buried according to the Jewish tradition. And Jesus' body was treated with respect as it was prepared and placed in this new tomb of Joseph of Arimathea and the opening sealed with a large stone. Jesus was buried reverently just as today we bury our dead reverently. The Gospel of John tells us that Joseph was assisted by Nicodemus, another religious leader of the day and a follower of Jesus. And in addition to Joseph and Joseph and Nicodemus, Mary Magdalene and Mary, mother of Jesus, saw where Jesus' body was laid. And three days later, when the women came back to complete the final burial preparations, the stone had been rolled away. They were confused and distressed. And then they encounter an angel who shows them that the tomb is empty. And the angel says to them, go tell the disciples. And just as they are leaving the garden cemetery, they meet Jesus and fall down and worship him. And Jesus sends them on to the disciples. The empty tomb points to the fulfillment of Jesus' word, that he would rise again in three days. However, the empty tomb itself is not enough to prove the resurrection. Throughout the years, there have been various theories about the empty tomb and questions about Jesus' resurrection. If a cover-up cover up were being attempted in the first century, women would not have been selected to bring the news by anyone other than Jesus. Jesus respected women. There were many women who supported his ministry, who followed him. But in the wider culture, women were not seen as reliable witnesses. Yet the angel, the women, and two disciples verified the tomb was empty that Easter morning. There had also been concern at that time among the chief priests and the Pharisees that the disciples would steal Jesus' body in order to fulfill his words about rising after three days. And so the religious leaders asked Pilate to post a guard at the tomb to pre present, prevent any action by the disciples. These were Roman guards, highly trained. And the Gospel of Matthew tells us that it was an earthquake that rolled away the stone. There was an earthquake and an angel rolled away the stone from the mouth of the opening. 
Now this earthquake and the angel had even these battle ready guards quaking in fear. And the guards would go to the religious authorities and tell what had happened. They would go to their superiors. And in order to keep the guards quiet, they were bribed to say that Jesus' body had been stolen by the disciples, a false narrative which circulated widely. There was another theory that, uh, that theory that the authorities, the theory that the disciples stole the body was disputed because the disciples stayed in Jerusalem preaching and teaching after their encounters with the risen Christ. The religious leaders, if they had Jesus' body, could have easily shown that body, disputing all of the teaching and preaching the disciples were doing. But they did not have Jesus' body because he had risen from the dead. There was another theory that Jesus said that the women and the others went to the wrong tomb. That would mean, however, that the women and Peter and John and the Jewish Sanhedrin and the Roman guards, as well as Joseph who owned the tomb, all went to the wrong location, as well as the angel. Consider also that when Jesus brought Lazarus back from the dead, Lazarus came out of the tomb, struggling with his linen burial clothes still wrapped around him. In Jesus' tomb, the grave clothes were left behind, empty. Something very different has happened in Jesus' tomb. And one other theory was that Jesus didn't really die, that he just passed out and he was buried alive, and that in the coolness of the tomb, Jesus was resuscitated. And this was confused by his disciples with being raised from the dead. Indeed, Jesus had said, I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own. I have the power to take it up again. I have the power to lay it down and I have the power to take it up again. Not only would this resuscitation theory go against Jesus' own words, but Jesus would have had to endure the torture that happened before the cross, the torture that happened on the cross, the confirmation of his death, as well as being entombed. In addition, having to move the entrance stone, getting past the Roman guards, before appearing to his disciples. There are numerous accounts of the physical torture and witness to Jesus' death recorded in the scripture, which speak against this. Now, the reason that Christianity is different from all other world religions is because of the resurrection. Jesus gave his life being the sacrifice for the sins of humanity to make us right with God. Without the empty tomb, there is no resurrection of Jesus. Without the resurrection, there is no Christian faith, no salvation, no hope for humanity. The resurrection is the proof that Jesus was who he said he was, that not even death could hold him. In the Apostle Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, there is a profession, profession of faith, which is been handed down through the generations. Paul writes this, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas and then by the 12. Witnesses to the burial and the empty tomb would be important in that early spread of Christianity. And in addition, there are Jewish and Roman sources and traditions which acknowledge the empty tomb. This includes a well-known Jewish historian, Josephus. Thus, the empty tomb becomes a wordless witness, a witness among others of Jesus' resurrection. The scriptures give us accounts of 13 times people or groups of people saw Jesus after his resurrection. Among those who saw him were Mary Magdalene, Peter, the two on the road to Emmaus, the disciples and others. They verified it was the same Jesus who died by the wounds on his hands and feet and side. 
And yet Jesus is not a ghost because he is able to be touched and to eat. Yet Jesus' body was different because he's not always immediately recognized and he's able to appear and disappear from sight. For the women and the disciples, that empty tomb brought confusion. Their faith in Christ may have felt dashed and empty. Yet as witnesses to Christ's resurrection began to share their encounters with the resurrection Christ, confusion became courage. Confusion became confidence and confidence changed to courage. Because the tomb was empty, because Christ was raised from the dead and the disciples were emboldened to witness to what they knew and had seen. The empty tomb was a powerful witness to young Philip as well. Philip was born with Down syndrome. He knew that he was different from other children in his Sunday school class. His creative teacher came up with an interesting activity for the eight-year-olds. The Sunday after Easter, the teacher brought large plastic eggs and each of the children were told to go outside and find some symbol of new life, put it into the egg container, bring them back into the classroom where they would share their symbols opening the containers one by one in a surprise anonymous fashion. So you can imagine a group of eight-year-olds running around on the church lawn in wild confusion, looking for something to put in their eggs. When they finally returned to the classroom, they put their containers out on the table. And surrounded by the children, the teacher began to open them one by one. After each one, whether a flower, a butterfly, a leaf, the class would ooh and ah, and then one was opened and there was nothing inside. The children explained, exclaimed, well, that's not fair. Somebody didn't do their assignment, right? Little Philip spoke up, that's mine. Philip, you don't ever do things right, another student retorted. There's nothing in there. I did so do it right, Philip insisted. I did do it. It's empty because Jesus' tomb was empty. Silence followed. From then on, Philip's classmates fully accepted little Philip. Philip died that summer at his funeral. His Sunday school class of eight year olds came to the front of the church, not with their teacher not carrying flowers, but each child laid on the communion table an empty egg. Philip had taught them the message of the empty tomb, that Jesus had defeated death, that Jesus lives again. When Joseph of Arimathea rolled that stone in front of the tomb, I'm sure he thought that everything was finished. God, however, thought otherwise. Just like at creation, God drew from the darkness, the emptiness, new life. From the darkness of death, Jesus was resurrected. Jesus' resurrection is the key to our faith and hope. For if Christ be not risen, as Paul writes, our preaching is in vain, and vain is our hope. Yet our faith and our hope are not in vain because the tomb is witness. The empty tomb is witness to God's power that Christ defeated death and lives again. The resurrection of Jesus is the cause of our resurrection on our last day. We should never mistake the empty tomb as being some benign little detail of the passion story, glossing it over as incidental. On the contrary, the empty tomb speaks of the in unfinished story of a life of faith, the open-ended journey that God has prepared that leads us to places we cannot imagine, whether in this world or the next. The empty tomb means Jesus has ridden, risen, defeating death. And it is that hope, the hope in the resurrection that motivates us to go beyond our self-interest to work to love our neighbor. The resurrection allows us to let go of our own judgments 
living life as intended by God, doing God's will rather than our own. The Apostle Paul writes in the book of Romans, it stands to reason, doesn't it, that if the alive and present God who raised Jesus from the dead moves into your life, he'll do the same thing in you that he did in Jesus, bringing you alive to himself. When God lives and breathes in you, and he does as surely as he did in Jesus, you are delivered from that dead life with his spirit living in you. Your body will be alive as Christ. From that empty tomb came new life. We who were dead in our sins received new life through our belief in Jesus Christ. May the empty tomb, that silent witness to the resurrection, inspire us to lives of service and witness for our triune God. May it be so. Thanks be to God. Our hymn of response is thine is the glory. Please meditate on the words as Jane plays for us. Indeed, thine is the glory, risen, conquering son. Endless is the victory thou or death has won for each of us. Friends, let us go to God in a time of prayer. Ever-present God, we gather to offer our prayers and our praises. You sent Jesus into the world to tell us of your love, your grace, and mercy to tell us of what you require of each one of us, that we work for justice, that we be humble, that we be merciful, and that we serve you and one another. Eternal, eternal one, like the disciples, we often encounter times of a confusion and fear, times when we are unsure about what to do or say. Give us confidence by the power of your Holy Spirit that we might be compassionate, loving, and courageous like your disciples. Give us the courage that we may speak of the faith we have in you, and that through Christ, we are assured of new life. We are reminded, O oh God, by the empty tomb of the promise given for us through Jesus Christ. Jesus has taken our punishment on the cross to make every sinner right with God. In response to that sacrifice, O oh God, you raised Christ from the grave to the sky to reign with you forever. 
and assure each of us of our salvation through Jesus Christ. Healer God, we pray this day for those who are absent from our fellowship due to health or other concerns. We pr <clears throat> pray that you would strengthen and encourage each one. For you, O oh God, know what is needed for each person. We lift up in prayer today, Steve, Jim and Sherry, Jan and Ken, Eric, Diane, Glenn, Joseph, and others that we have not named aloud, but that we hold in our hearts. We pray this day for the families and friends of the eight people killed in Atlanta. May your spirit offer them comfort. May your spirit offer comfort to all who grieve. And may your spirit be a word of encouragement for those whose days are dark, who face discrimination and fear, who feel unsafe at their workplaces and in their homes. Loving God, you call us to care for one another and you desire that we should live together in peace. So we pray for wisdom, Lord, with ourselves and with our neighbors. And we pray that you might help us love our neighbors through our words and our actions so that all will feel welcome. We give thanks, O oh God, for this congregation, for we know that wherever two or more are gathered, you are present in their midst. And so we give thanks for that assurance. And together we pray as Jesus has taught us, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If you have not already done so, I encourage you to leave your offering in the box at the back of the sanctuary. We are reminded that all that we have is a gift from our loving God our talents, our skills, our resources, and that we return to God's service, a portion of what we've been given as a way to honor and glorify our God. Let us stand together for our doxology. Let us pray. Try on God, receive the gifts we bring as token and pledge of the offering of our very lives to be your disciples, to follow in faith wherever you lead. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our hymn is Christ is Alive. You are encouraged to remain standing if you choose and meditate on the words as Jane is playing. A reminder of what the resurrection means for each of us and the proclamation that we can take from worship this day, that Christ is alive, and we will celebrate that in just a couple of weeks.
Christ is alive and comes to bring good news to this and every age, till earth and sky and ocean ring with joy and justice, love, and praise. Friends, receive the benediction. May the love of God, the grace of his son, Jesus Christ, and the power and presence of the Holy Spirit be with you today and always. Amen and amen.